Okay, everyone, welcome. We're recording this session as an introduction to the Flatten the Curve Summit. Uh, Flatten the Curve Summit is a remote summit we're going to be doing on April 21st, 22nd, and 23rd. And it's going to have expert speakers from public health, digital freedom, and across all kinds of disciplines, law, and, and all kinds of cool stuff. So you guys should join that. Um, the URL for that is flattenthecurve.tech. And we have with us today a freelance tech journalist and investigative reporter. Her name is Yael Grauer, uh, and she's done a lot of awesome stories in security, um, surveillance, mass surveillance stories, stories about um, all kinds of uh, privacy issues with technology that we use every day. So we wanna kind of have these chats as an introduction and to let you all know the types of conversations we're going to be having at the summit and also to allow sort of a diversity of voices that we couldn't quite jam into the schedule. So welcome. Thank you. So one of the things I wanna ask you, um, and I'm sure a lot of people are thinking about it, is how journalism and, and your profession in general has been changing because of COVID. Oh gosh, yeah, it's been pretty intense. So there's been a lot of, if you look at like staff positions, there's a lot of people doing really great work. Um, and they're being furloughed and laid off um, because a lot of newspapers um, or publications that they're at rely on advertising money um, from places that just aren't advertising or maybe from events uh, that aren't happening. And so that's pretty depressing. Um, and then as far as freelancers, there's a lot of places that are freezing budgets. Um, luckily, not all of them. So, um, you know, there's some people that have been able to kind of like I can't pitch these eight places, but I can pitch these 10. And so there's still been like some uh, fair amount of work being done. But as far as like coronavirus related stories, I feel like there's a lot of really good investigative work that could be being done. But, um, you know, healthcare workers are being threatened with their jobs. Um, so I think they're more hesitant to talk about what is actually happening. So even though there's been, we've seen a lot of really amazing work from like ProPublica and and all these different newspapers, but there's a lot that I think is not being uncovered just because people are, um, you know, rightfully concerned about losing their work for just telling the truth to the media. Sure, so as far as outlets go, um, I've seen some reports about staff being let go, obviously, um, especially entertainment outlets, those kinds of places. Where do you see this going? Um, do you think the mass media, the, the big outlets are gonna survive this or transition completely online? Or how do you think that's gonna, gonna play out? Uh, I think newspapers are gonna get hit pretty hard. That's kind of what we're seeing. And they've been kind of on a downswing for a long time. Obviously not all newspapers, the New York Times will probably be fine. <laughs> um, and then online outlets, yeah, there are a lot that I think might not, like might just fold completely. Um, but I think there's always going to be good journalism. It's just, it's kind of depressing how many people are being laid off and, and what that's going to look like. But I think it's similar to other industries where like, we'll probably still have restaurants when this is over, but not all the ones we love. Sure, sure. And do you see any new outlets springing up or any opportunities for, let's say, you know, if journalists want to start their own thing, band together, is anything like that happening or conversations like that occurring behind the scenes sort of, or? There's some grant money that people are, are giving out and, um, and, and obviously there's a huge, like if people, like health journalists, like if you can write coronavirus stories, or even just, um, like I've been asked to write a lot of stories about like, how is this affecting privacy? How is it affecting productivity? How is it, um, like just to take your beat and put that kind of spin on it, there's more of a market for that, which is, um, you know, something people who are looking to do can do. Um, so yeah, I don't know. It's hard to say, like, it's hard to say industry-wide exactly what's happening, but there's a couple really good spreadsheets going around. There's one um, that Study Hall put together about all the places that are no longer taking assignments because they've cut their freelance budgets completely, um, but it also has a list of places that are still taking stories and what kind of stories they are, uh, and then I don't know. I think it might be easier on, I mean, I'm biased, but because I've been freelancing for so long, but I feel like freelancers are better at kind of being resourceful and finding opportunities out there. So even though we are more vulnerable, because it's a lot easier to just cut, cut a freelance budget than it is to lay off your entire staff. Like, I feel like we also might be more, a little bit more resilient and kind of used to the feast and famine of it, so. 
Yeah, I was talking to some artists and I basically same kind of thing. I was like, well, you know, you're used to being broke. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't know about that. I mean, I always feel like if I lose work, I have to just pitch harder to the places that or, I don't know. Or I, I did a little Twitter thread today and I was like, if you're a freelancer, like, like pitch the places that are still accepting work and try to get more work from them like lined up and try to get longer contracts and try to get more money and try to diversify your skill set if you can do that without going crazy because there's a lot of people who are freelance writers that also have a design background or a tech background or can do other things um or maybe they have like a huge email list and can sell info products so like it's just something to kind of be a few steps ahead and think about so that you're not just quitting freelancing to work at a warehouse or something unless that's what you want sure sure so um I know one of the ways you mentioned, and, and we've talked about this in the past, that uh, journalists sort of get together is um, collaborating on spreadsheets or having like a, a private group that they talk on, maybe like a Slack channel or something like that. Have you seen those methods of communication change? Is everybody doing Zoom happy hours like I see other professions doing, or are, is that relatively the same modes of communication? Um, I've seen, I, there is a new Slack group that popped up that's just for freelancers that are affected by coronavirus, like financially. Um, and then, yeah, and then I've seen, like the spreadsheets that I mentioned is like lists of places accepting pitches and, and places that are, are not accepting pitches and stuff like that. But yeah, I, I feel like the community is really good at just kind of stepping up and doing what needs to be done to get information to people. Um, and then a lot of it is informal, like um, somebody DM'd me the other day and was like, are you still getting work? And I'm like, yeah, here's the places we both have written for that are still accepting pitches. And these are the ones that aren't. And like, honestly, for us, we were pretty lucky in that the places that have dropped pitches were already paying badly anyway. Mm -hmm. so, so it hasn't, I, don't know, I feel like it's affecting other people harder. It's hard to like know exactly how it, it's hard to kind of get that broad view of an entire industry because like I'm doing fine you know? <laughs> like, so, but I know just looking at the numbers and hearing other people's stories that like other people aren't um, but yeah there's still zoom I, there's more like events that have popped up I know open news was doing more support type stuff and um, it feels like it has kind of shifted a little bit um, but yeah there are, there's still a lot of zoom happy hours <laughs> Yeah, I mean, one of the things to me, uh, I think everybody's going to have to do a little more is kind of sell themselves as the product a bit. Um, now, you do a great job of that. You've got your own website that explains well who you are and everything. But I think these folks who are in these big tech outlets um, or just news outlets in general are um, not used to that. So um, do you expect there's going to be sort of... Um, it's going to make it harder for freelancers when those folks end up in the same profession, so to speak, and not so siloed off in their own little camp or oh, like think, if, yeah, like, like if, if a bunch of people from a big stable of reporters that have big names suddenly are now doing the freelancing thing or doing investigative reporting, is that going to make it harder for people who are already doing that now or? Yeah, I I feel like I the way that I look at it is different than other people because I've been freelancing for, for so long. But I don't I don't really I don't know maybe I should more, but I don't really look at people as comp. Like I I feel like the work that I do and the work that I get isn't really dependent on other people. So even if there's other people doing similar work, like like maybe mine's slightly different or I have slightly different contacts or connections. So I don't even though I am competing with them, it doesn't feel like. I am and I'm happy to like share resources with them and like I feel like it's more cooperative than competitive um and even people I compete with are always telling me like oh this place is looking for pitches and etc and I feel like that's kind of the difference between newer writers and more established writers because when you meet newer writers they're like at a conference trying to surround an editor that's trying to leave the room and like giving you dirty looks if you say something that people laugh at or whatever <laughs> and like the more that I do this the less I feel that way Okay. So things are not necessarily changing too much. Just um... <laughs> I don't know if I'd say that because there's a ton of people that are losing a lot of work. I think it just dep it's really dependent. I don't know. It's like if you if most of your work is for a single client and that client's no longer taking freelance, right. it would have a really big impact on you. Um, but I guess I try to look at it like more proactively. Like, um, what else can you do? Who are your other clients on your list? Who else can you pitch? And just kind of keep your eye on that prize and don't 
get depressed about it because the more that you pitch and, and sell yourself, the better you'll do. Um, and if people are losing jobs in freelance, like there's going to be more sites popping up to fill that need. So I don't know, we've just been hearing about the demise of media for so long, but like I try not to, not to think about it too much because I think it would discourage me from finding the work that is out there. Sure, sure. And it's one of those things where, and, and you know, they're telling entrepreneurs and people working in all kinds of fields, you've got to just kind of keep moving because um, <laughs> standing still is not going to help you anyway. Right. right. And then people who are used to getting a, like, not everybody's cut out for freelancing. So even if people freelance for a while because they, you know, have to, but don't really want to, like, they're going to end up getting job. Like they might go to PR or like event management or whatever once this is over. So yeah, I don't know. I'm trying to think about though. Cool. Very cool. Um, okay. So you've done a lot of interesting stories in the past year. Um, I, I guess I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit. Um, but something you've done recently, and I'm going to ask you about, you know, which specific one I'm going to ask you about later, but um, <laughs> something that is not Zoom related um, that, that you think is awesome that you've done recently that you'd like to kind of highlight for everybody? Something that's not Zoom related. Oh, I joke that I'm on the votes beat because <laughs> I've been investigating this company called Votes that claims to do secure online voting on the, using the blockchain, even though it's not secure. And they don't even use the blockchain at a point where it would actually matter. Um, and there was just a report that came out by, a, I think it's AAAS, that was talking about how online voting is not secure. Um, and so I wrote about that for Coindesk and just what all these experts have been saying. Um, because that is something that coronavirus impacts if people don't feel safe um, going to vote in person. Um, like, should we vote by mail or uh, vote online? And like all the experts and all the research for the past decade has been saying like, it is not safe yet to vote online using these methods. So that's something I've been writing about quite a bit when I'm not writing about Zoom. <laughs> cool. <laughs> so we saw obviously a, a catastrophe with the Iowa app uh, for the Iowa caucus mm -hmm. a few months ago. Um, I took a pretty close look at that and it was a mess, but um, not something that I think can't be sort of fixed or in this time period that somebody might try again. Um, do you think, have you heard any rumblings about that or are people still just kind of like, you know, vote by mail, we're not gonna do the app thing anymore? I haven't heard anything, I haven't heard much about Iowa. I think people would be hesitant just because of how awful it is, but there's also like, we have a president who's convinced that people are voting fraudulently by mail even though he voted by mail. Um, I did see a recent study that showed that it's not, um, the voting by mail doesn't favor any particular political party, so hopefully that will help kind of quell, quell those um, kind of misconceptions that he's spreading. Yeah, I mean, the, uh, the vote by mail thing is going to be kind of interesting if we end up bankrupting the uh, post office. <laughs> oh, yeah, I've heard people like joking that like, oh, that's what, how he's going to kill vote by mail, but I don't know what would happen with that. I wonder if Amazon would buy the post office. <laughs> Who the heck knows at this point, yeah. right? I know. That's, uh, but that's like in the Constitution. I don't know. I can't even imagine not yeah, having a problem. It's a strange Nothing. world we're in, though, right? A lot of things yeah. are changing so quickly. Um, yeah. So on that, you know, obviously we're talking, um, we're using Zoom right now. I don't know if you can tell when we <laughs> record the video. We'll find out. Um, but it must be that green border that tips everybody off now, right? <laughs> Um, but yeah, anyway, uh, so we're obviously using the largest video sharing platform. Who knew that Zoom would come out of this whole thing just kind of owning um, video chat? Uh, I didn't expect it, uh, and it's just kind of mind-boggling to me that people are using it more than the phone now, basically. So <laughs> anyway, um, you worked on a story with Michael Lee over at The Intercept about Zoom. Um, so if you could just kind of summarize that for everybody and then maybe your thoughts on the response to it, because I think that part of it was also kind of interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that story kind of came out of, um, I wrote a story for Medium first and it was about like, here's some things to worry about, about different chat tools that you're using. Like, um, um, and, and I was convinced that Zoom was then encrypted because that's what it said in its documentation. Um, but then I started looking into it. I think you had mentioned a few things and a few other people had told me a few things. And, and so I just like emailed their, after the Medium article, I emailed their spokesperson and was like, when you said end in encrypted chat, did you mean video chat or just a little messages? And, and what about this thing in your white paper? And they basically admitted to me 
um, oh yeah, no, we're not, we're not indent encrypted. And so I was kind of confused. I was like, are you saying that you don't use that term because we're talking about video or are you saying that you lied in all of your documentation essentially or um, used, or as they would say, use the definition of end-to-end -end encrypted that others don't use or something. Um, and so like I was talking to Mike about it and he's like, we should totally write about this, which I thought would be really cool to work with him because he's like a tech genius and could write up that part of it. And I did a bunch of interviews because I was like, isn't this, like a potential FTC violation if people are using this service because they think it's encrypted over other services that are also not end-to-end -end encrypted like isn't that like misleading a, the consumer to like gain market share that way um and um just like how difficult like it is kind of a hard problem to solve um and so I was kind of looking into that and we wrote this story and it just went like bananas so it, it did better than I expected honestly um, but yeah, I think you're alluding to like, there was a little bit of a backlash because some people, and I hope I'm not mischaracterizing their argument, but they, I think they were like saying their family members use Zoom and they don't want them to be like scared or ask questions about it. So it's only responsible to withhold information from the public or if you write a news article about Zoom basically using misleading advertising, it should be written not as a news piece but as like a security guide where you analyze the security posture of every other competitor and like tell people this is who this is a big issue for, like if you're sharing secrets or whatever, as opposed to um, something you would publicize anyway. Um, and I just don't, I don't really agree with that because I don't think that every story has to be like a service oriented digital security guide. And I definitely don't agree that you should withhold information from the public because they don't want to answer questions from their family members or whatever. Um, but the other part of what has happened is that it seems like Zoom appears to be at least like kind of stepping up and they're hiring like really great contractors to work on some of these security issues. They changed um, some of the misleading content. Like if you scroll over, I'm scrolling over right now. It doesn't, it no longer says end in encrypted. It just says your client connection is encrypted. Um, and they've changed some of their uh, documentation and, and, um, yeah, it'll be interesting to see what happens because also some competitors are kind of um, stepping up too and are like, we're going to try to do this the right way. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what this looks like six months from now or a year from now. Yeah, I mean, to me, I kind of feel like um, the actual content of the video isn't very useful for these companies anyway. Um, yeah. Their primary thing is vendor lock-in, right? So as long as they can keep people using this stuff, um, why do they care that much? Uh, I may be downplaying how much surveillance is going on of the audio. Um, maybe mm. there's some keyword analysis or something like that, but I don't yeah, know what the use of the stream would be. I don't know. So I think the it's not even so much, like for me, there's certain threat models I have, like if I'm having certain conversations that I don't, I don't care so much what, what the company does with it, but that they have the possibility of being able to do so, because that's what I'm looking at. Like, am I communicating on a platform where it's, I, unless like people are really lying, like it would be difficult for them to access the information and respond to a government order or like in response to a court order or whatever. Like, um, um, like is this security in a way that I feel comfortable with? And, and it just isn't. And, and so like, maybe it doesn't make a difference for, um, you know, like if you're going to put your video on YouTube anyway, but in certain circumstances, it does make a difference. Like if you're talking to your therapist or if you're a journalist or whatever, like, um, and so, um, and I don't know if, like, I feel like there is room for people to write those kinds of articles, like the type of things that people are like, it's irresponsible to write a news story unless you do X, Y, Z. Like, while I don't agree with that, I do think that there is like room in the industry for people to write those articles where uh, there's a great chart that Paul Schreiber put together, which um, disclosure, I helped him test a few things, um, but it's just comparing different tools and there's been some good information that's come out of it. So I think it's definitely like, I always try to do work that has a lot of impact. And I feel like that article is kind of changing the playing field a little bit, which is good. So. Yeah, I mean, I think so. I think that was kind of the watershed article out of all the Zoom articles. So um, I, I think the interesting part and, and the thing that a lot of folks might miss is that the non-technical thing you're talking about, right? Um, I mean, it was technical in a sense, 
um, but it's not like overly about a specific bug or security flaw or anything like that, which a lot of the other stories sort of were. Um, mm -hmm. And therefore, I think it had a lot more legs than those other stories as well. Yeah, well, the Zoom bombing story I thought was pretty interesting too, and that's what caused a lot of the FBI, like a lot. I think it. I think that's also why, like, people were blaming certain articles for like New York public schools are no longer using Zoom, and I'm like, that's because they're getting Zoom bombed with swastikas and like hate speech right. and profanity. Like, it's not because, like somebody wrote that Zoom's not end and encrypted, you know? like it's based on their own experience and just maybe they think it'd be easier to switch to a new platform than to kind of retroactively add passwords or get a, a thousand or a million teachers to like add passwords to things and whether that's true or not I don't really know like I don't know I'm not in that school system so I don't really know how they made those decisions but um yeah, it's all been, it's been interesting. I thought it was really cool that they seem to be kind of stepping up and taking it seriously, though I'm kind of waiting to see if that, how that actually pans out, because there's been times in the past where companies were like, we take your privacy very seriously. <laughs> so, and then they just don't make the changes that they say they're going to or that you expect that they will. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see what happens next. Yeah, I, I mean, I think they can only go so far without changing their product to something that's not going to be as profitable for them. Um, so we'll see. Uh, but they, they seem to be getting a little better. I know there's been a lot of conversations we're getting um, about using Zoom for the uh, conference for the summit. Um, <laughs> and I'd like to use something else. You know, obviously, you know, I'm a big free and open source software person. We're very aware of the privacy and security issues. Um, but Honestly, there isn't anything we can, with a small team, handle a lot of users in a room, know mm -hmm. that we can record the stream, and then be able to have consistent results. Um, so that's I've been using Hangouts quite a bit. I don't know if we've been recording it. There's a new app, uh, like a new plugin that will give you the Brady Bunch screen that everybody loves for Zoom. Um, and then one of my clients was talking about setting up a Mumble server. I know Jitsi's working on end to end. I don't know when that's gonna go out i think webex there's ways to make it end to end encrypted um facetime but everybody has to be on a, on a mac <laughs> um but there's there's options out there i don't know if any of them are great but i've had kind of issues with zoom too though honestly yeah, like I just mean, not showing up in chat and just little kind of ux type type things yeah i mean i don't often join really big zoom <laughs> sessions so it's going to be a bit of a learning curve for us as well i think but um Jitsi is great. I hope that end-to-end -end encrypted stuff happens. Um, that's going to be awesome. Big Blue Button is one I've been looking at a lot. Um, that's focused more on teaching, which is cool. So it's got like, you know, it sort of focuses on the slide and presentation aspect instead of just showing faces all the time, mm -hmm. um, which is cool. Uh, so we'll see. But um, There's one called Doxy, too, that I know a lot of, like, health professionals are using, so I'd be really interested in, I haven't researched it myself, but I'd be really interested in seeing, like, how, how good it is, privacy security ones, because I know there's a lot of, like, therapists and, and stuff using it. Yeah, yeah, and um, that's huge, and it's just, it's just such an interesting thing, because the COVID-19 pan pandemic has just sort of accelerated all these trends. Um, it's just amazing to me that overnight everybody switched to video chat platforms. Yeah, I don't know why people aren't using Signal too. Like a lot of times people are getting on Zoom, like we're on a one-on-one -on -one chat and I know you're recording it, but like a lot of times people are like, like when people are like, oh, there's not a good alternative for Zoom, they're like, if I have 50 people and want to record and have chat and break them out into rooms, but like that's not what a lot of people are using it for. And there's totally other tool, like video tools for just one-on-one -on -one chats that I don't, I don't know. I don't know why. Yeah, it's been really interesting. My inbox has been really interesting the past couple of weeks. So. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that's a good place to stop. Um, thank you so much for this conversation. Um, I hope you're doing well there in Arizona. Um, yeah. Family's good. Dogs are good. Or so far, yeah. I feel like I'm. Yeah, and I don't want to. I don't, I don't want to jinx, jinx it. it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> See, I got to be careful with my questions, but. Um, <laughs> Yeah, up here in Connecticut, it's been pretty, pretty wild, but uh, we're doing okay hunkering down here too. So um, I don't know, it remains to be seen how this is all gonna play out, but uh, I very much appreciate your perspective and um, we'll see where we are in a few weeks. So. Awesome.
Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Oh, you're very welcome. And uh, for those of you listening and watching, um, we're going to have more conversations like this. Uh, we're going to record a few more of these with individuals, and then we're going to have the conference. And then if you're interested and you want to reach out to Yael, um, just either contact me or you can go to yaelwrites.com. Um, is there an email address you want to give out to anybody? Or? Uh, Yael at yaelwrites.com. <laughs> okay, there you go. That works. Cool. All right. Thank you. Thanks.